Hello, welcome to Mothership. I'm Carrie Grant and we are live. We're talking about online bullying today and with technology taking over the lives of our children and in fact us, how do we stay safe? The thought that I could be sitting next to my child, we both might be on our phones and she could be being bullied as I sit there is actually quite terrifying. Now don't forget, we wanna hear from you this afternoon. So do write your comments in the box. If you've got questions or you've got ideas, strategies, any comments, we wanna hear from you. Uh, my guest this afternoon is Will Gardner. Lovely to meet you. Uh, he's CEO of Childnet. So you are the super expert and we are hoping that in the next half an hour, you're gonna tell us all how to get our children to be safe online. In half an hour. In yes. half an hour. So first of all, why don't we start off by just setting the landscape for us. Could you talk us through what the different types of cyberbullying are? What, what's going on out there and the um, scale of it? Okay, so there's a, a number of different ways that children can be cyberbullied or online bullied. And it can be as simple as extending the face-to-face -face bullying that, that might happen, they might experience, just taking that onto the online space. So it can be the name calling, uh, type of type of bullying, but it can also be uh, threatening. It can be threatening. It can be sharing of content that people didn't want to be shared. It can be gossip and rumor mongering. It can take a wide range of uh, different forms, but it's really an extension. The best way to define it is is bullying just using technology. And then we have this horrible thing, indirecting, which is where you're not even calling the person something, but you are doing it via somebody else or in a way that the person that's meant to be bullied knows to you. they still feel it though right absolutely technology you, it connects us closely together with others and it enables us to have a wider audience in in that space so you can be you can be very mean about somebody online without uh, even 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 mentioning their names because the audience so will know subtle. who you're talking about yeah ab ab absolutely i think but we need to put it in the context where children and young people are also engaging and interacting and having a lot of fun online and trying to put oh, the yeah, whole thing into some are. type of proportion. Yeah, exactly. They're barely, you know, they've all got neck problems because they're all like that the whole time. Yes. My, my neck hurts, Mum. Yeah, there's a reason yeah. for that. So, so there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of good uses of the internet and all their different social media platforms. But one of the things that I find really hard, I don't know about people out there, is how can I stay ahead of the game? It feels like, you know, first there was messenger then there was facebook then you know ask fm was the big thing for a while and now snapchat insta but mainly snapchat but certainly for communicating and and bullying i mean my family's undergone so much bullying my girls have on snapchat um how do we as parents stay ahead of the game that's a really big challenge and and uh an example i was uh speaking to a group of young people speaking to an 18 year old recently uh, and they were describing their 14-year-old brother, and he described his 14-year-old brother as being from a different generation to him because of the he was using completely different online services and apps than he was when he was his age. Yeah, so absolutely. I noticed the difference between my 23-year-old and my 16-year-old. The 16-year-old is way more into all of this stuff. So it's, it's a fast-paced environment, and I think um, the message we want to give out to parents and carers is, is an encouraging one. You know, you have life skills. If you don't have tech skills, there are skills you can use that are applicable and you can support your children in this space, even if you don't understand technology. But at your disposal, you have young people who can be the ones to introduce you to that technology if you're willing to show an interest in it. So we would always encourage parents to to talk to the children about the types of services they're using. Use that resource that my you have. My kids are like, you are not looking at my phone. Yeah. I mean, I do look at their phone and they know I look at their phone, but they don't, generally, they don't want to because there's messages coming in all the time and there might be something that they just don't want mum to see. It's a bit like reading their diary. Yes, and the mobile is a very personal device, but there are other ways in which you can do it. You can either talk about uh, some services that you've heard in the media. You mentioned Snapchat, for example. You might want, can you tell me a bit more about that? Are you using it? Can you tell me how it works? And, and you know, there's some fun things within Snapchat that, you know, everybody can be silly and use it and yeah. you can get that we level of engagement. We all want a pair of Bambi ears, don't we? Let's <laughs> yeah. face it. For, for, for example, so, that, so that's there. But there's also a lot happening in the media. Online and tech is, is very, very topical. It's often front page news in some different form of nature of risk that are facing children and young people or celebrities who get into trouble using social media. There's lots of conversation starters out there if, if you want to look Even for them. Even presidents of countries. Even presidents. Even. Um, let's have a little look at uh, what's coming in from you guys. So we've got... Um, Ollie Curry is saying, hi, Nurture. He's a big fan. Lovely. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Um, 
Becca, it was saying that she was bullied when she was young, up until last year. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, she says, I always thought they were joking, but it hurts. And I'm glad you're talking about this topic. Now, that really straight away brings up to me, for me, the difference between bullying and banter. Because often we think banter is, oh, I was only joking. I was just kind of bantering with you. But if that's hurting the person, how do you know? Like, where is the level at which it crosses the line? How do we know that? You can answer that, you know, that's, yeah, a, that's a deep uh, question, I know. But. There, there we go. And we have, um, we have a, a resource we use in secondary schools, which we call Crossing the Line, with, which is designed almost exactly to do that. We kind of put the problem to young people and to say, well, where do you think the line is crossed between what is okay and what is not okay behaviour? And, and the rule of thumb what is... What do you think? I'd love to know what you think. What's bullying, what's banter? Yeah, keep going. The, the rule of thumb that we would use um, when we're talking to children and young people, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're talking to. If they think it's banter, then it's banter. But... If there's Some a, if people there's have quite cruel, a cruel sense of humour, though, don't they? Ab absolutely. But we need to develop that level of empathy and understanding. And I think the online space, which can enhance communication, keep you closer to people in that way, can provide something of an empathy gap because you can't always see the impact of what you are texting or posting so on the true. other person. That's so true. Even, I don't know about you, but even about texting, you know, you, you, because you're doing everything shorthand, you know, even someone, your partner, your, someone in your family, whatever, you text them and it, you get the wrong end of the stick straight away, you know, and, then, and you think, I didn't actually mean that, but I was trying to answer with three words and an emoji and it doesn't really explain the depth of what you're trying to say. No, absolutely. It was, the capitals were completely by accident. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> that's, uh, that's just what happens. Yeah. I think also, um, just looking at some of the things that we're getting in here, people are saying, how do I prevent cyberbullying? But in a way, is it preventable or do we just have to accept that it's out there and we have to practice this stuff until we get better at it? So almost accepting that there will be stuff that we say that is wrong as young people or as adults even or have said to us that is wrong but we've all got to learn to practice how to use the internet in a way that eventually works so that it's affirming rather than bullying i think i think there is there is work that we can do in this space and i do believe it will have an impact even you know obviously we'd li all like to get rid of bullying and, and cyberbullying included in that and, and we need to be realistic in 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 that but we need to also empower young people to be a better support to other young people it's not just particularly in the online it's not just a bully and a a victim if you like there's often surrounding uh, actors people who are part of the online community that might see what is there and i think there's work that we do certainly with with the bully the perpetrator to to help them really understand the power that they have and they're abusing and the hurt that they're causing and to make sure that there's no accidental bullying, if you like, and make them understand where what banter is and where it crosses the line within that space. And also working with the person on the receiving end to make sure that, you know, we don't want them to become a bullier because it's one of the easiest things to online if you get a message is it, in that rage, you want to spontaneously retaliate. And we want to try and encourage young people to, to take a breath, take a step back, not to inflame the situation. It doesn't mean that you are, you become powerless, but more keep Keep the evidence of what has happened. Don't reply in anger in any way so, and, and escalate because quite often that's what the See, bully that's, is after. That's so interesting you say that, Will, because when we ask the internet, which we do at this point, one of the things they are saying is do not reply. Don't, just don't even entertain. Don't even get into the conversation. Would you I think, say that? I think, that's, I think that's good advice. It's good, safe advice because that, that is what the bully is, is after in this concept. They're looking to get a reaction. That's, the, the, that's what we would anticipate that's what the person wants and by not providing that then I think that's a good safe step forward but it also allows you to give you time to take stock and think about what is the best solution to to this problem and the, the, cy the cyber element has the evidence capacity that's if there's a positive about cyberbullying is that you can show somebody what it is that has happened it's, and head teachers would say it's Except no longer you can't if it's snapchat and it's disappeared yes okay there are there are there are exceptions to that I and mean, we do know that it is possible to snap a Snapchat and to keep things in that way, but you have to be quite um, speedy. What we did it. was when, before my uh, daughter was opening some bullying messages on Snapchat, we got another phone and then filmed them and then took that to the school. Right. Um, and that was horrifying, actually. I've still got those messages on my computer at home and I um, should really get rid of them because it's just awful. But that was horrifying, actually, not just for the the girls 
who then had to look back and go, oh my gosh, there's evidence, look what we said. They were saying, you know, you're depressed, why don't you kill yourself? Uh, things like that, which is really not helpful. Um, but also for their parents, you know, and I felt sorry for those parents because I do think that it can happen I mean, that kind of extreme stuff you'd hope not, but kids are saying stuff that they would never in a million years say if they were face to face or if their parents could hear what they were saying. How do we, how do we even begin to contain that? Well, a um, no, number, number of different things. I won't solve this problem, but I think the fact that there is often evidence, you talked about how you photograph the Snapchat, that is a possibility, but I think it's enormously empowering for a young person uh, to be able to report something, either even to discuss it with their friends about this is what's happened to me, but ideally with a teacher at the school or a parent or carer or in, in that fashion, and in serious cases, even to the police. The fact that you have something, it's not a question of are they going to believe what I'm saying. This is going to help people believe what you're saying, and that can be enormously it's that evidence, in, in, isn't it? empowering elements within that. In, on the issue about, you know, I think the parents will be shocked about what their kids are doing. I think there is an important message. You know, we don't want... None of us want our children to be the, the victims of cyberbullying, but obviously none of us want us to be, our children to be a bully too. And yeah, James, you've just uh, sent your message in. Sorry to cut across yeah. you. What's your number one piece of advice for when you find out your own son or daughter is a troll? <sighs> like, you know, that's hard, isn't it? That's a hard bit of information you've got to hold on behalf of your child. That is, that is, um, that is really hard, but I guess the... The good news, if there is some good news, is that you know, and there is something that you can do. And you know, very often the advice we give to parents is to have a conversation. This sounds, that sounds quite an important conversation to have, to try and talk to people about, about the negative impact that you can have just by your online actions. It doesn't even have to be bullying. It can be, it can be even the banter that we talked about before. We, it is important to have that level of conversation. There's lots of information and advice online which you can find uh, on our site, childnet.com, but also other sites which can help support you with these conversations. Now I know, like, like all good parents, what I would say is, just take their phone away. <laughs> yeah. That's not the right answer though, right? No, no, it's not the right, it's not the right answer because... It's so much easier well, if you could, wouldn't it? I can't say for all situations, but often... It's like the, withdrawing often, oxygen. <laughs> it, it, it is, it can deprive young people of a support mechanism that they have. Their, their social circle, their peer group, and, and, you know, to be disconnected in that way can be, can be very distressing for a young person and not actually make the situation better. So, so we would advise you know that that seems like it's the easy thing to do. And we first wrote guidance on for schools on cyberbullying back in 2008. And this was the type of thing that people were talking about then. Well, if you're getting bullied on MSN, then just stop using MSN and the problem is solved. But it doesn't resolve like that. I mean, uh, Zany Amy is saying my problem is the school says because it's online and off the school grounds. I was going to ask you this because the same happened to us. They can't do anything. So you just said about there about, you know, going to school and sharing it with your school. But some schools will say, not my problem. It mm. happened on the bus on the way home. Well, it's not true that they can't do anything. Uh, there is, there is a, there's an Education and Inspections Act that was passed in 2006, I think it was, which gives the head teacher the, the power to an extent that is reasonable to regulate the behaviour of pupils even outside of the school okay. grounds. It was designed more with bullying on buses to and from school community back in, back in those days, but it is entirely relevant for the online space because very often the services which kids are getting bullied on aren't necessarily services which they're accessing in, within the school grounds. So it's really important that schools have the power. It's not a duty, they don't have to get involved, but they have the power to do it. So for the school to say they can't do anything, isn't true and it can, bullying that happens outside of school can really negatively impact on the child within the school community. Of course, of course. Dillis Mills is saying here, the teachers at my school said, just ignore them, that was useless, they didn't do anything. And I think often we do come with those pat answers, just ignore them, really? Mm. I'm getting home to a hundred messages, that I how do I ignore that? Yes. I think it's important we don't try and oversimplify bullying. I think we'll come out with some some key advice that we can give to young people, and particularly in relation to cyberbullying, I've mentioned already about you know keeping the evidence, and, and you can use blocking tools and such like. Different yeah, Monica Lewinsky, I love her. She does a lot on the anti-bullying side now, and she says, she "Block is beautiful." That's her phrase, and I use that phrase all the time now. I love pressing that block button. Right. Oh, it feels good. It feels empowering. It is. If empowering. someone has yes. told you and they've said something really horrible, you just go. That's Absolutely. It. I don't need to hear from you now. Now we've got a question here from Mark McDonald. He says, um, 
such an important topic in this day and age. Thank you for that. Um, should social media platforms themselves offer more support for parents of children who have experienced cyberbullying? So the actual, you know, what, what are Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what are they doing to measure it, evidence it, act on it, support the children or young people or adults that are being bullied? What's being done in their space? There's... There's a few different things which have happened, and I guess it's, it's worth being aware of them. I think we're seeing industry has been on a learning curve within this particular space, and I think quite often with, with new popular services, the safety element catches up behind the, the popularity, and we've kind of seen that, that model exist. But there are some really useful things which are out there right now, and uh, Facebook, for example, created something called the Anti-Bullying Hub, which has been live for a couple of years now, but in amongst it is... If you're worried about your friend being bullied, or there's information there for parents about how to begin conversations about this, it kind of feeds you some useful phrases that you can use in these difficult situations. So there are, there are some elements out there. Clearly, there could be a lot more, and we are absolutely want to be encouraging industry to be playing their part, both in terms of their amazing communication medium for us to reach key audiences like parents and carers with key messages about how to support children, how to prevent cyberbullying, what to do if it happens and such like. But there are certain platforms that seem to, or appear as me as a parent looking in, to their whole reason for being there is to comment on people's looks and look at how many likes you've got. I mean, as someone Carrie's just said, uh, my younger cousins on Instagram do polls about their looks. How can I get her to stop? And they do. And then, you know, boys and girls, young men and women, are going onto those sites and they say, I'm not a very nice person, I'm not likeable because I've only got this many likes and I've only got this many friends and therefore I'll make my page really public and I'll make my site public so that they can get more likes. And it feels like it's a barometer for their self-worth, mm. which then I mean, that makes them very vulnerable to bullying, doesn't it? But the very raison d'etre of Instagram, it feels to me, is that it is actually about com commenting on people's lives and whether you think they're good enough or not. Mm. I, th I think it's important we try and understand that whole, that whole environment that children and young people are operating in. We did, we've seen with social media the last few years, it's moved to a very visual form. Young people are communicating with Pictures, images and videos yeah. and emojis and, and, yeah. and such like. And we did a bit of research on look, looking at that. And in amongst the data was the number of likes it takes for me to feel happy about something I posted was about 53. You know, that was a kind of... 53 likes. Lev That's a lot of that was likes. A, that was the level. And I think we need to tackle that in a number of ways. One is about critical thinking. You know, remember what you're looking at is is what people are presenting. It's like a, your PR exercise, if you like, of, of yourself. Managing online. your brand. A little bit to that. Not all of it, but some of it is that. And so you need to be looking at things with a critical eye and not to, not to value value things by the number of likes that they've had. Yeah. Sorry, I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm also reading this at the same time. Holly Graham mm. saying, should you stop your kids from using social media until a certain age? Or is it going to be harder for them? Now, I know this from experience again, mm. that musically, so young boys and girls, and I'm saying boys and girls because I'm talking about 9, 10, 11, most of them that I know in the area that I live are on musically. Now, they're not using it to message each other, so they're not using some of the other parts of that service, but they are they all know how to do the lip-syncing thing. Mm. Yes. So should we just be saying, no, sorry, you can't have that? You'll have no friends till you're 13, and then you can get some friends online. The, because that's how they communicate after school. The sites, all on it. the sites you're talking about do have, have their age limits, as, as you know, and most of them are 13. Some have changed to 16 uh, just recently. But there's no passport entry in order for young people to access these services, which is the problem. You don't have to prove your age in order to... No, to, to, sometimes to the parents it. are setting it up and putting their own age in. They, they, you know, they, can, they can be, which, which is, is worrying because it's almost encouraging. It's setting an example of, you know, you just, you just need to lie in order to get access to this. To this. Mm. So we have, to, we have to... I mean, the sites are designed for the older age group. So this age limit is there, and we would ask people to respect it. But we know that many children are using these services who shouldn't be, and we can't just ignore that fact. So in our work, we go to schools all the time. We are working with primary school children and trying to give them the rules of the road, if you like, so they know how to keep safe whilst using the Internet, know what is okay and not okay to share, you know, know when something 
was worrying you know to report. So it's kind of skills that you could carry into the social media environment yes. without trying to encourage young people into that space. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that is also uh, carried through with how you bring your children up anyway. Something that uh, Lorena's just picked up on, up on here is life skills training is, is extremely important to help empower children and youth. So in terms of life skills, yes, social media skills, but actually kindness, if you're teaching your child to be kind, I'm hoping, I mean, I really hope this is a parent, that that means that when they go online, generally speaking, they will work out how to be kind online. Yes. I, I, I think kindness, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on kindness and friendship in the primary school age group. And certainly, I think trying to bring the online element into that as early as you possibly can. We have a book called DigiDucks Online. You don't have to, yeah. you can just access it. And there's, it's about trying to get the friendship story but to give it the online context too, and we'd encourage that to happen from a really early age, right from the beginning. Let's just talk about when it gets really serious. Um, I'll go back, I won't give too many details about this, but Boxing Day about three years ago, I uh, heard my daughter crying in her bedroom and she was on the phone to Childline. And within about another half an hour, the police turned up and someone was trying to groom her online. And they took it really, really seriously. Um, is that a common experience? I mean, we had really good service, I want to say, straight away, both from Childline and from the police. Is that common? Because it feels like, I, you know, I'm reading about my daughter's friends also sending news to all kinds of people out there. It feels like, wow, children between the age, when I'm saying children, 11 and kind of 14, it's gone crazy. Is that just my perception or is that actually all happening out there? Well, it, it, it can, it can, obviously, you know, it can happen. And that's the message that all parents need to know. There is this risk and, and it is there. Things have got better. We know the first case in the UK happened where a child was groomed online was in the year 2000. So, and that was in the, ch in the chat room. So that was kind of going back. And it has that's been... a long while ago. It was a good long while ago. And it happened in the US before it happened in the UK. So that is, that is there and it happens. It's changed in its form a little bit because... Then it used to be that the, the groomer, if you like, wanted to meet the child offline. Now that is still the case, but it's also about, well, you can share images uh, with me, and I won't necessarily yes. even be a meeting, so you can be groomed to share in, in that sense. It's important that everybody knows about it, but it's also important that people know that they can do things to try and prevent it. You know, simple safety messages that you would give to your young people about how to use the internet. A primary school can be given in an age-appropriate way about keeping your contact information safe, not giving that out to somebody that you don't know online. If you're asked to meet or if you're asked to share something, you know, that's a trigger, you should tell me or tell someone. We have a police force, CEOP, who you can go and report this thing to, which has you know, been set up in the last about 10 years ago. So there are people there who can help. Uh, we've had, oh gosh, it's Lippy, Salis, Lippy Alice sometimes. Uh, she's all joined up as one word, can't read it. Uh, she says, blocking makes it worse. I really hear that, I hear what you're saying there. If you can't see them, you don't know what they could post about you once you've blocked them and, and you can't do anything about it. And I think this is, the uh, reason why I've picked up on this particular one is because I think, because you just shared, share it with you know someone and I'm thinking, well, I have such a great deep conversation with conversations with my children they would share it with me but I'm not sure you know I just go well you need to block them and they'd be like oh trust me there's my mum with a size 10 feet getting in there um, children don't like sharing with their parents this stuff I don't know whether it's because they feel ashamed but you've started digital leaders haven't you on ChildNet can you tell me uh, probably because of this thing I'm just talking about so tell me tell me what they do Sure. Um, Digital Leaders Programme is available, it's a schools programme and the, the idea, the premise of it is that we all see internet safety as really important and we all think that industry can do more, parents can do more, government, police can all do more, but young people feel very passionately about this topic. They, re they, they, they have a real, this is a very important, online safety is important to young people and, and this programme is about mobilising young people in their school communities to make a difference. And, once they've done online training, they then go and try and earn badges by running sessions for their peers, discussing about, you know, some of the latest tech and talking about how to keep safe online. And we know that young people are very receptive to their peer of audience course. because it's relevant and it's but within... Also, because their peers know how to use the stuff. Because <laughs> yes. Most parents are still going, where's the stop button? It's, uh, part, of the, it's part of the shared experience. And so that's, that's really powerful. But also young people's voice is important and powerful reaching parents too. 
We know that you know, it's a real draw for parents to come into the school and listen to children and young people talk. It can help with school staff. So at the moment, we've got about 4,000 digital leaders around the, around the country who are active in their school community. And it's really, it's a very positive, empowering program. Not giving all responsibility to children and say, here's the problem, you fix it. Mm -hmm. But you can be a part of this solution. Internet safety is something which involves you and it can include you. It's not something we will do to you, if yeah. you like. So it's done with rather than to. Exactly. Yeah. And um, what has the response to that been? It's been amazing. You know, it's been amazing. And, you know, young people are taking the programme and, and using it in different ways. So when the government issued their internet safety consultation, was it last March, um, we gave the questions out to our digital leaders and then fed their responses straight back to government. So they've got real voice and could be active participants. Some schools have, uh, one school we visited recently were working with children who had been temporarily excluded because of their online behaviour and as they were coming back to the school they ran a session with these pupils to kind of reintegrate them yeah. within the school. So young people are kind of owning this program. And I'm using all for, for that restoration, being able to restitution, make things right. I think it's really important that we don't demonise the bully so much that they then they end up so excluded right. that there's nowhere else for them to go. Absolutely. I think, I think, um, I think we, there's a lot we can explore by using young people in this particular way in a, a range of different formats. If it's presenting, if it's about informing the school, helping the school with policies or whatever it might be, I think there's a real power at our disposal which we're hoping to mobilise. Someone has just said here, Duncan is saying, I love the topic, how can I tell if cyberbullying is definitely taking place and you know, try not to overreact? So what are the signs in your child? What should we be looking for if, you know, as signs of, hang on a minute, my child's this is different, the child's changed? Yeah, that's, um, that's a very difficult question. And it, it's similar to bullying in the way where you pick up a change of behaviour. You know, it's just a cha any, any change in behaviour that just seems a bit... Um, They're so moody um, anyway, though, aren't they? <laughs> yes. well, well, you've I mean, got five kids, yes. you know about moody. Yeah, I, I think I'm experienced in that, in that <laughs> topic. But, it, you know, if there's a, a change in even moody behaviour, that can be a useful yeah. trigger. And, you know, if, if they were really engaged with technology and then all of a sudden they're less engaged or they're using it slightly differently, I think there's scope to just to be asking... As we would ask when kids come back from school, how was school? Is to ask, you know, is, is everything okay? What are you up to online? Anything you want to talk about? That type of thing. Just to keep that channel open. I went out onto the streets doing some filming about 18 months, two years ago, and I had an iPad and I said to parents, I made sure they were parents before I chatted to them, and I said, do you know how to put the restrictions on your child's devices? To which they all answered, yes. I then said, okay, here's an iPad, could you show us? and not one knew how to do it. Mm. So as parents, we've really got a long way to go. And I think, you know, I probably do know how to do some of that stuff and I do know the different platforms that my children are on, but I still feel, I don't know about you, I'm a parent of four, you're a parent of five, I still feel like I can't keep up with them. I can't be looking at every message coming mm. in. There's a, well, there's a lot in that. You know, the, the temptation in many of the parent sessions that we run in schools, they'll be asking about what tech solutions there might be to try and help keep yeah. children safe and whether you know how to put the restri restrictions on I think it's important you just know it exists and you can google it and probably you'll be able to find out how to how to, to make it work but a lot of this is beyond the technical solution it's about behavior and it's about trying to make sure that your young people know how to behave online and they also know how to what to do if something is is troubling them online we've got about one minute left so I just want to ask you what would be the take-homes for people watching today? I know people, Becca's just written in, don't add anyone you don't know and never be afraid to share it with people. I think those are great pieces of advice, particularly try not to be afraid to share it. I, this is, it's almost like people will say, but I am really afraid to share it, but don't be afraid to share it because sharing, we have to create an environment and a culture of sharing, don't we, where people feel that they can share this stuff and, and the bully isn't going to then retaliate against them somehow. So sharing, what would be your, what would be your uh, take? Absolutely, I mean, your, a key message that we start giving to children and young people right from the beginning is to tell someone. If something or someone is worrying you online, it's to tell someone. And I think the key message for, for parents and carers listening is to be ready for that telling when it, when it happens. The previous question talks about not overreacting, is to just to, to listen and to, to keep that channel of communication and help support young people within this space. But there's lots of information available for parents and carers. You know, there's a lot of work being done in this area. If you're, if you're worried about anything, you're not sure what to do, 
then look online. Childnet have a website, um, childnet.com. You can find information. But there's a range of really useful, practical guides that can help parents in this space. So I yeah. want to encourage people rather than yeah. throwing your hands up in the air. So this technology business mm. uh, is too complicated yeah. because we can we can help support children in this space. Lovely. Thank you so much to Will Gardner. Thank you for your comments and thank you for watching Nurture this afternoon. Do remember you can keep your comments coming in. Let's keep the conversation going, keep communicating, keep getting advice and strategies and uh, all the best. Let's just try and wipe it out. Thank you.